Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is love. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We're just blessed that you can join us and be with us to fellowship in the Word of God, the eternal Word of God. So, uh, we're continuing on in our study in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, first letter to the Thessalonians. And this will be our 11th part, or chapter, as I like to say. Um, and I, I just want to remind you once again, if you're new to this, that you can go back on our, on our site here and watch the other editions. Uh, catch up on it or invite others to get caught up so that they can join us. Or even just go back and watch them again because they watch always again. pick up yes. something else when you yeah. review it again. The Word of God is always. good stuff. Always. Amen. Um, we'll be starting in the fourth chapter. We left off last week uh, in the 10th verse, so we'll be starting at the 11th verse. 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Okay, mm -hmm. but before we do, I'm going to ask Mark to ask God's blessing upon our time together tonight. Wisdom and understanding. Oh Lord, it says in your word, where two or three people come in your name, that you are present also. Please be here to guide us and show us what we need to learn. And we are so thankful for your word on this day. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, let me just, before we start, let me just remind you, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com, okay? If you would like a copy of the notes that I use, you know, I, I, every Friday I get kind of just pray up myself up and jot down some notes about uh, what we're going to cover. If you'd like those, you can ask, ask me for those. And we do appreciate you. Uh, those of you who do send uh, our emails, send us emails, because they are very encouraging. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. It's, it is a blessing. Uh, okay, <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul writes, Make it your ambition, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you. The first thing there is the word ambition, right? Now, uh, different translations use a different word. I'm using the New American Standard. I think, I think in the King James it uses the word study, which had a broader sense in when the King James was written back in the early 1600s. You know, it's like Paul writing to Timothy saying, study to show yourself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. It meant to apply yourself. It, uh, or to well, concentrate. It, it still does, mm -hmm. but we don't have that common usage. Uh, one of the translations, I think, says aspire to, to this. But ambition is a good word, because ambition is a common word, uh, a word that we use frequently in, in our English language today. And Christians are commanded to be ambitious. But while in the world, ambition seeks to please oneself, as a rule, right? Think of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians when he said, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to, the, to him, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So that's 2 Corinthians 5, 9, by the way. So our ambition should be to be pleasing God. That's the thing that should be the great desire of our life. Our ambition, as all of our life must be, has to be not self-seeking, but seeking to serve the Lord. That's what our ambition is supposed to be. You know, from this, and think about what he's saying here, to lead a quiet life, attend your own business, and work with your hands, right? This led to what was known quite some time ago, and you don't really hear this term a lot, what was called the Protestant work ethic, right? We don't hear that much anymore. Because the, the Protestant work ethic was you're being very diligent about applying yourself to your work, it involves integrity, involves ethics, it, in, it involves diligence to your job, commitment to your job. Mm -hmm. And that's why, back in our history, you would look at 
these uh, people who were very, very successful in life, even if they weren't very religious, had this ethic that came from the respect that was typical of the Bible. The Bible used to be held in re high regard, even by people who didn't serve Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of examples of that in the early history of the United States of America. Because a lot of the founding fathers were not Christian, in spite of what you may hear. They were deists, they were, they were part of the Enlightenment, uh, but they all had a regard for the, for the Scripture, something that is not evident in our world today, which is one of the reasons you don't hear this Protestant work ethic very, very much. This is what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. So Paul is condemning that kind of life. All right? Um, today there is a sense of entitlement in the world. Like, you know, you're entitled to stuff whether you work or not. The Word of God says that if you, if you will not work, you will not eat. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean if you can't work. It doesn't mean that, if you, you know, that you shouldn't eat if you can't find a job. Or it doesn't mean that you, can't, you shouldn't eat you know, if you're not, not able to work. That's not, that's not the Spirit that's of God. You have to be willing to work. And but you have to have a willingness. Right. And what he's saying is if you're able to work and are unwilling to work, you know what? Don't eat. Right. That means you're lazy. And laziness was always a problem in humanity. It still is. It was back then. It is today. That's a form of greed. Well, it says in Proverbs, go to the ant, O sluggard. It, it, it does indeed say that in Proverbs. It, it, it's a form of greed. Well, it's a form of stupidity. People, well, people get things, or they want to get things, and not have to put the work in. And that's greed. Well, it, it, uh, uh, Combination, I would think. Okay. Because value yeah. for value is not there. I, I understand what you're saying. I just, you know, I don't think I typically don't think of it as greed. No. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, wanting something for nothing. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, it's like, you know, we've become a society where there's not there's not this kind of risk reward. There's not this return for your labor. Mm -hmm. You know, th and that's a just balance. You know, it says a worker is worthy of his wage, right, or his, his hire. Mm -hmm. It's, there's supposed to be this balance that what, what you put out, you know, you, brings a return to you. So whether you're seeking a, a greater return than you're working for, uh, or, you know, you're seeking to get a return without working, that's, that's not a balance. That's not a just balance. And that's an abomination to the Lord. Okay? So... Remember the fact that God took Adam, he formed Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden. He put him there to cultivate, mm -hmm. to work, yeah. to work with. And, and think of this, you know, Paul's writing, and it says, work with your hands. Yes. There was this concept of the dignity of labor, all right, that we don't have as much today. We have kind of a, a, a managerial uh, perspective perspective on things when I was young going back a long long time first of all the vast majority of people in this country in the United States of America did not go to college That's right. okay <laughs> the number of people who went to college back when I graduated from high school I went to a college prep school which you you know but most guys and, and girls at that point especially girls right. did not go on to college and people who were going into trades, they didn't go to college to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. They went on the job, and they went through an apprenticeship, apprenticeship. program. Mm -hmm. and they were they were trained on the job. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know, it was the English poet back in the 1300s, uh, Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, mm -hmm. who first said, "Idle hands are the devil's workshop." You ever hear that expression? Yes. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was that. That was that common philosophy in earlier times where you need to be working it's this is this is it's God's command well if God put Adam in the garden and told him to cultivate it to work it 
And then, by the way, when Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the garden, he said that you were going to work, but no longer will work be pleasant. Right? The difference is man didn't begin to work when he was kicked out of the garden. To the contrary, God put him in the garden to work. But working in the garden was a pleasure. Yeah. And sin made it an unpleasant task. All right? I was saying managerial. This is one of the things, you know, uh, the Word of God says that the, the harvest is white and the laborers are few. We're to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, workers, workers into the field. Well, if you look at the church today, and particularly in the Western world, we're sending managers out, you know, to, to manage this right, whole deal. Right. Because of a number of scriptures in, the, in this whole culture, uh, it's, it was typical and still is typical in religious Jewish families today, regardless. And, and by the way, if you think of it, um, I think my perception, at least, of Jewish people, and this is, I'm painting with a broad brush, and speaking in general terms, is they tend to be more apt to be working with their minds than with their hands. Okay, is that, that's, and that's, uh, that's not a derogatory statement, okay? Um, well, the garment industry, the diamond industry, I mean, uh, the, Maybe they ain't in the mud, scratching and digging in the no, dirt. No, no. They're not scratching in the dirt to dig up the diamonds. No. Okay, they're managing it. Um, I'm saying that they tend to be, but this, this happened as kind of an evolution of culture because for centuries, because of the bigotry against them, they were not allowed to own land. Mm -hmm. When we had an agricultural society and everything, when people you know, made their living um, by working the land that they owned, they were not allowed to own land. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they wound up being managers and finding, finding niches finding opportunities in occupations that rather than working their hands work their minds mm -hmm. okay uh, but even so today in religious this is what I was going to say a, a Jew, young Jewish boy may be and it may be his parents ambition it may become his ambition and it may be his education to become a doctor or a lawyer but it was considered godly to learn a trade mm -hmm. with their hands something to fall back on well, it's not just, it's not, no. it's true that that is a fallback position, mm -hmm. okay? But it had, it wasn't that purpose. The purpose was that it was God's intent that we're able. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul, the guy that's writing this, was highly educated, yes. okay? He was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He sat at the feet and was trained by Gamaliel, one of the most famous rabbis of the day, absolutely. But he was trained from his youth to be a tent maker. So, you know, here in Thessalonica, he works with his hands. Mm -hmm. And throughout the New Testament in his letters, you see that he, he has that occupation as a tent maker where he earns his own way. He's, he's doing as normal with Paul. He's not just preaching something, he's living it. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it, that work ethic is a, is a good thing. In religious Jewish people today, typically like with Orthodox Jews, who start their day with a formality of, of numerous prayers called uh, Barakoth, or, yeah, Barakoth, the knee. which comes from the word for, a Hebrew word for bending the knee. The, one of the first prayer they pray to start the work week is this. May the grace of God be upon us, and may he establish the work of our hands. Because it was always this concept of being able to work with your hands. All right. Um, is that in scripture? Is that in, in scripture that prayer? prayer? No, absolutely not. No, that's, yeah. no, that's a rabbinical teaching. That's mm. uh, in the Talmud. It's in the Talmud. Yeah. Okay. But think about it. Paul wrote later on here in, in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica. He said, "For even when we were with you." We used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined wife, life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. So this was a problem that Paul had addressed, but he addressed the problem before it sprung up. Why? Because it was a common thing in that pagan world. Paul is now in the Greek world. Right? 
Yes, it was the Roman Empire. But that Roman Empire was dominated in many ways by Greek culture and thought. So, think about this. Remember when Paul, in Acts 17, remember we're talking about a progression here in our study of uh, Thessalonians. Paul went to Thessalonica. He was run out of Thessalonica and went to Berea. From Berea he went to Corinth. From Corinth he went to Athens, right? When he went to Athens, what did he find in that pagan world? Uh, gods to various gods, and okay. one to the, un the unknown god. Okay, There's something else he found. Okay, because here's what it says in Acts 17. Now the Athenians and the foreigners visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. That's Acts 17, 21. You're right. They loved to sit around and talk. Yeah. Not so, work. Not work. Talk. Talk. Um, I don't know if that's a problem in the Greek world today, but I'll tell you there's a problem in the Greek world today. But that's a problem that's, well, it's a problem throughout the, the Western world. It's a problem throughout the world, is the economy is a problem today. Now, Mark, you keep using the word greed. I say that greed is the root of that problem. And I'm going to tell you that I can remember over 30 years ago teaching Bible studies and talking about how this, the economy of the world was headed for collapse because it was built on greed. Mm -hmm. And now I'll agree with you entirely because that greed, one of the manifestations of that greed is, is that people wanted more and more as a return for less and less. Now they want something for nothing. So, you know, we became less and less productive. Mm -hmm. Now, I, listen, I, I can't define, I can't tell you the, the solution to the problem because I don't even know if there is a solution to the problem. There, but well, I, I contend that there's not a solution to the problem for two reasons. One, it says the whole world is in the hands of the evil one. So Satan is controlling of it. it, it the, the biblical way of thinking is you should get what you're worth, balance for balance. Trade which for why, trade. Okay, which is why Paul is saying work with your hands. Satan Make wants it. the exact okay. opposite. So he wants people not to work to get all the benefits, p the people to work not to get what they deserve. Anything out of balance he loves. The second, I forgot. Okay, good, but because now I forgot what I was going to say, too. <laughs> um, the, oh, America has become less and less productive. We used to be a nation that produced a lot. Now, most of what we consume ourselves is produced outside of the United States. We have become a less productive nation. That's how Rome fell. Well, we're not going down well we're not going yeah, down. I don't want to. <laughs> okay. But but the fact of the matter is, we should be we should have the ability to be productive. Um, again, in Genesis. 215, it's clear that God put Adam in the garden to cultivate it. Mm -hmm. Now, cultivating means that you do work, but the purpose of work, what, what did Adam gain by working? Now, bear in mind, he didn't have to work for his food. The food was there to be had. He didn't have to work to go out and buy new clothes. Hello. So what was the purpose of his work? To please God. Well, it was pleasing God, but it was participating in God's work to cultivate it, to grow it, to, to be fruitful and multiply and turn the entire earth probably into the garden of Eden. Right, right. Our purpose in working, our purpose in working now is about participating in the work of God. Well, that hasn't yep. changed. That's always been my God's purpose in the world. No, yeah, it's, it's God's purpose. Yeah. But it's it's changed in as much as that's not that's not mankind's focus no. at, all. Not at all. And <clears throat> if we are going to apply our hands to do the earthly work, because we have to work. Yes. I mean there's nothing and there's nothing wrong. I'm not demeaning the work by any means. Think about what Paul is saying. But the work of our daily lives, what we apply our hands to, has to be directed by a mind that is set on the things above. So it's our hands are working here on earth, 
maintained. directed by a mind that is set on the things above. And that's key. And one of, one of the things that we deal with is the fact that, by and large, most Christians don't live an integrated life. In other words, they kind of turn off their spirit to go work with their hands. And that's exactly the opposite of what Paul is commanding the church here to do. All right? We need to have that attitude that we take the work that we're doing, and that work is directed as everything in our lives has to be directed by the Spirit of God. And that's a, let me just, that's the purpose of the ministry that we started back in 1992. The M.D. Solomon Institute was to help equip and train the saints of God to apply the Word of God in their daily lives to whatever you're doing. Because again, you know, yes, we're, we're spiritual beings. We're out here. We're ambassadors for Christ. But we're working with our hands. I mean, Paul was a carpenter. Abraham tended his own flocks. Um, Jesus was a carpenter. They learned these trades. You've got to be able to apply yourself. Why? Because we're, we're supposed to be going out into the world and being, while we're not of the world, right? We're in the world, but not of the world. We're out there participating. This is how we mingle with the unsaved. I was going to say that people today are not content in their work because of the attitude. Well, people the out there are, are not content, period. And, and that but was I'm, I'm cultivated. Talking about, well, I'm talking about Christians who should be content in the work, but they're not. They're not. They don't have the attitude that they sh they need to have to perform and do the work that God is calling them to do. The Apostle Paul said, "If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content." Mm -hmm. We are bombarded daily. We are driven by a culture that is a consumer-oriented culture. Oh my goodness! You know, as as we do this study right now. <laughs> Today oh is the day of the Thanksgiving in the United States of America. It's called Black Friday. I mean, you'll hear about riots um, in, in stores. I was reading the news this morning, and, and in one store, some woman was so anxious to get to the toys that were going on sale before anybody else that she used pepper spray to spray other shoppers. So, I mean, it's insanity. It's mass, mass insanity. But that's because we're, we're driven to, to want, to want, to want. Um, you know, we have to learn as Christians to distinguish between what we need and what we want. And I promise you, the world, which as Mark said, and as John said before him, is in the power of the evil one, a father of lies. You know, he's trying to deceive everybody to say you can't be content, you can't be happy without having what the world has to offer. Well, that's not why we're here. Yeah. Right? We're here to be those ambassadors for Christ. Our joy is supposed to be a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from what you can buy at Walmart or Neiman Marcus, you know, wherever you go. Um, but we have to get to that place where we are content, satisfied. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to go into this whole study no. about satisfaction, but that's, that's a, a subject that is dear to my heart. Because I'm going to tell you, without Jesus Christ, you'll never be content. And if you need more than Jesus Christ to be content, you've been deceived by the devil. And you need to be able to tell the difference between your needs and your wants. All right? Is it wrong to want something? It's not wrong to be wanting something. I don't, I don't see that as an evil in and of itself. But to be driven by that want is a problem. It comes about session. Right? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about all this. So, um, but do think that there is dignity to work when it is done in a godly fashion. Christians should not be, like the rest of the world, going to work and complaining about the work they do. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in my seminars, one of the things I've always taught is that if you're not having fun, if you're not enjoying, if you don't have joy at work, right. you are either doing the wrong thing or you're doing the thing wrong. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because you're doing the thing wrong. And to find people who are happy at work today is few and far between. Few and far between. If you are not enjoying the work you're doing, I'm going to say this, you are not doing it as unto the Lord. You're doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you got a problem. And all the seminars in the world out there that the world has, 
all the promotions, all the raises, all the anything will never bring you satisfaction. But God can satisfy you. All right, let's, let's move on, right? Verse 12. All of this, the purpose of this Paul is saying is that so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Okay? Talking about needs and wants. Now I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to answer it too. Okay. This, is, this is a question and answer thing. Question. What is proper behavior towards outsiders? That's what he says. Mm -hmm. So that you will behave properly towards outsiders. Okay, so then my question becomes, what is proper behavior towards outsiders? My answer is this. To do everything in your power, even at the risk of your own life, to bring them to safety. That's what they did in the Old Testament. I don't know. Time and time again they did that. That is the answer. That's the only proper behavior towards outsiders. The mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now have been hidden from your eyes. Luke 19, 41 and 42. Christ wept over the fact that his word, his spirit, his love was being rejected by the people that he came for. His mind was to bring salvation to them. What's the heart of the Father? Peter wrote, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, to come to eternal life. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. So the mind of Christ and the heart of the Father is to reach out with the love of God and bring people into salvation. You know, and that's something that started out in this letter, as I recall, when we were first talking about it, that, that it was about bringing people into that place where they are saved from the wrath to come. Remember that? It's, uh, in the first chapter, back in verse 1, verse 10, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 10, all right? Paul talked about waiting for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The focus of Paul's life was that people be saved. So now, if, in all that you do, when we're talking about outsiders, two weeks ago, we talked about, in the ninth part of this, we talked about Paul's words when he said here um, that we are to abound in love for yes. one another yes, yes, yes. and for all people. Mm -hmm. Right? Our love is not just contained within the brothers. It's and for all people. And we talked about that a lot uh, two weeks ago. But the fact is, that's your proper behavior towards outsiders should be driven for your love of those outsiders. Mm -hmm. Your concern for their well-being. Your concern for their eternal lives. That's, as I said, the mind of Christ and the heart of the Father. All right? Well, think about it. You know, it says, let a man examine himself. I, I, I can say this here in the Bible study, but when all is said and done, this boils down to you getting into your prayer closet and spending time with the Lord and examining yourself and thinking about this. You will either see outsiders, the people out there in the world, as people who can benefit you or, you can, or who you can benefit. You will appraise them and either see them as a potential for your gain or see yourself as a potential for their gain. Jesus Christ said this, Mark 10, 45, Mark. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The problem in the world, a world that is in the power of the evil one, is that people are selfish. All the more so as the day grows closer. Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of self. That's how it starts, lovers of self. If you're a lover of self, if you don't have that mind of Christ, the heart of the Father, if you don't have that same attitude in you that was in Christ Jesus, 
You're going to see other people, and all you're concerned about is how they benefit you. When a godly mind will put this in your heart, how can you bless them? How can you benefit them? All right? If you listen, do you, do you agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. So what we've got to do is get this perspective, this godly perspective, where we look at people and we see their needs. We see the peril that they're in. It's not about us. And I'm talking about, listen, this is not some great theological thing. I'm talking about when you go to the grocery store. Do you see the clerk behind the counter as somebody in need, in desperate need, of what you have? Do you have that abounding love for others outside the body of Christ, people you don't know? We have a hope to offer them. Uh, we're going to talk about hope, I promise you that. Okay. So, if, if what concerns you, if your concern is your wants, then you'll be self-serving and self-seeking. And self-centered. Well, that, that is, if your concern is you, right? Yeah. That, that is self-centered. But then you're going to be self, that will cause you to be self-serving and self-seeking. Mm -hmm. If your concern is your need, then you have no concern. Because the Word of God says, Paul wrote, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 4, 419. Got it? Yes. So you, I think that's kind of cool. If your concern is your wants, you're going to be selfish, you're going to be self-centered, you're going to be self-seeking. You, you will not behave properly towards the outsiders. Mm -hmm. If your concern is your needs, you have no concern. So this is why it's so important to be able to distinguish between what you want and what you need. And the only thing that should truly move us is if it's not our needs, it's the needs of others. That should be what we want to do. You know, uh, I probably don't want to go here. But I probably will anyhow. Let's live on the edge here. We are going into a period right now as I mentioned, as we do this Bible study live, it is the day after Thanksgiving, that holiday here in the United States, and it begins the official purchasing hysteria that goes on here until yeah. Christmas good, time. Good choice of words, by the way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that purchasing. is the purpose of today's shop. Purchasing yeah. hysteria. Well, but that's what it is. And that is not driven by need. By want. It is driven by wants. The Lord forbid you should go out and buy your kid just what your kid needs. My wants and tradition. Well, but I'm, under, I'm talking about want. I understand what you're saying is true. But to make this distinction between wants and needs. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes, I mean, going out and buying what people need is not what drives the shopping hysteria no. at this shopping season. It's buying what people want. You're going to hear over and over and over what your kids want. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna think about what would my husband want, what my wife want. It's, and again, you know, a, a, a loving heart is a giving heart, and there should be a desire to bless others. Okay, but we are driven by tradition, especially not, I mean, for this time yeah, of year, not godly tradition, to go out and think about all these, and we will spend literally billions of dollars on junk that nobody needs. And we will ignore, and I, yes, I am talking about Christians, and we will ignore what those people need. Because when all is said and done, what people need is the Word of God. They need to be contacted and connected to the living Word of God, who was made flesh and dwelt among us. Don't let your kids go to hell with a smile on their face. Get them what they need. Start, start, just start being driven by your passion, your passionate desire to reach out to the lost with the Word of God. Uh, listen, you want to work with your hands? <laughs> Go out and grab a sinner. <laughs> Do something. Reach out with the love of God. I mean, these are perilous, perilous days. Right. Grandparents, especially. Um, okay. You can skip a generation. You can write Alice at office at BibleTalk.com. Okay. 
why do you have to be driven by these ones? Think, think about the Sermon on the Mount. I love the Sermon on the Mount, most radical sermon ever preached. Jesus said, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Those are needs. Okay? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, the unsaved, eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Matthew 6, 31 to 34. So the Lord's promises, he will supply all the things that you need. There's not a lot in Scripture about dealing with the things that you want, about dealing with your wants. And I, again, I'm not going to say, you know, we want things. We should aspire. Well, let's go back to the beginning of the study. What do you want? What's your ambition? To get this, to get that? Or is your ambition to lead a quiet life, a godly life, working, doing the work, partaking and participating in the work of God here on earth? That's why you're here. You are here to participate in God's work here. I'll share this again. I know I've shared it a lot of times. I, I'm going to share this until the Lord takes me or he comes back. I have gone into hundreds of churches around the world. And I think maybe one of the last times I did this was at a pastor's conference. There's a whole bunch of pastors over in England. And said, do you believe that God wants to bless you right now as much as he possibly can? And inevitably, every hand in the room will shoot up. Absolutely. Amen, brother. True Absolutely. question. Well, it, it shouldn't be a trick question. No. But the fact is, I'd say, okay, I'm going to get you to repent of that. Because if God wanted, here's the truth. Don't turn me off. If God wanted to bless you as much as he possibly could right now, brother, you would drop, tune, lifeless to the floor. Because as Paul said, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We have something ahead of us, better than where we are right now. If God wanted to bless you as much as he possibly could, he would call you to be physically in his presence with him in a place better than where you are. But he has purpose in your life. What's your purpose in life? We are a fragrant aroma, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are a vessel, an earthen vessel, filled with a treasure. Your purpose on this earth is not to accumulate, not to get all the stuff that you want. Your purpose on this earth is to bring the presence of Christ Jesus, the love of God the Father, into every place and every situation. You have a job to do. You have work to do here in this place where God has placed you. Do that work joyfully. Do that work cheerfully. Do that work giving thanks for what God has entrusted you with. And reach out and behave properly towards the outsiders. You mentioned in Matthew about being anxious. And just thinking about that, if Christians were to obey this command of not being anxious, do you know how much that would change the world? How much Christians could change the world? By not being anxious? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I think I've shared this with you before. I remember back in the late 1970s that uh, there was a news article. It, it caught my attention just before I was preparing for a Bible study, as a matter of fact. It was a convention of, a national convention of either psychologists or psychiatrists or the combination of the two. In, it was taking place in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I, what struck me was, and this was reported, I think, in Time Magazine, mm -hmm. that the keynote speaker gave an address, and he was not a Christian. As a matter of fact, he was a Jewish doctor. Mm -hmm. And he made the statement during the course of his keynote speech that if everybody followed the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, all of these psychiatrists and psychologists would be put out of work. <laughs> So much of the problems in the world today are driven by anxiety. Anxiety over... They have no, well, but, but, but it boils down to, you know what it really boils down to, is having an assurance yes. 
that your needs will be met. Exactly. And it, it's, you know, that there is a loving Father who would not withhold any good thing from you. For God so loved the world, the Father so loved you, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross. You know, I, I, I remember saying this at a Bible study here before. How can you not believe that God will put food on your table when he was willing to put his son on a cross? Maybe you just don't get it. Maybe you just really don't get it. And yes, I'm talking to you Christians. Paul, this tent maker, turned the world upside down because he was sure of the love of God. Go read Romans chapter 8 if you don't believe me. I pray that you have that blessed assurance so you know that you are free, that you are free to live with a concern for others. You don't need to be concerned for yourself. And it's not about gaining stuff. It is about, it is about gaining, bringing gain, prosperity for the kingdom of God. We're, we're going to get into a, a, a part of this letter now where we really have a focus on on the end, all right? Which Paul has, by the way, throughout his letters. That's always on his mind, you know, um, because he has a mind set on the things above. And Paul, if you remember, has actually seen what's to come. That's right. That's right. Yeah. right? God gave him that vision, gave him that sight of what's to come, something he said he could not speak of. But I want to make this statement. I want you to think about this. A desire for earthly prosperity is inversely proportional to a desire for Christ's return. That sounds logical. Well, as, a matter well, of fact, as a matter of fact, it is. Because you're either on, if you don't want Christ to come back, you want to do something else besides that. Well, but they're, that's, they're inversely proportional. And that's to get right. stuff here. One, one goes up, the other goes down. Right. Okay. What I'm saying is, you will find, and this is obvious today, the more your heart cries out for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more the word Maranatha, even so, look on Lord Jesus, is on your lips, the less concern you will have for what you have Absolutely. here on earth. That's true. The more concern you have for the things of earth while you're here, the less concern you will have and the less desire you will have for the return of the Lord. Now, that's contrary to most of the teaching going on in the quote-unquote Bible-believing church today. But test God, it. God doesn't want us rich? Well, that, you know, Paul said, it's not a matter, see, this is a problem. It's, it's a matter of what God wants and what we want. It's a matter of want. What I want to be is pleasing to God, and I want to be in that place that he wants me to be, wherever that place may be. You know, Paul said that he learned the mystery. Now, a mystery is not like what you find on Channel 63 or whatever on television. It's not a problem to be solved. Uh, when God talks about a mystery, it's something that is beyond our comprehension. And Paul said that he had learned the mystery of being filled and going hungry. That he was content in whatever situation he found himself. It's not a matter, it's not evil to be, to have stuff. No. And it's not, it's not a lack of faith in evil to not have stuff. Exactly. All right? It's just a matter of being where God wants you to be. We, Alice and I have been blessed. I mean, we have had a... Both ends of the spectrum. When I got saved, I read these words, that Jesus Christ came, that I would have life and have it abundantly. Mm -hmm. Abundant life, and but Jesus said that when even when a life... Ha even when a man has abundant life, his life does not consist of his possessions. We have been blessed beyond almost belief in this decades that we've been serving the Lord. We have lived in a, in a mansion on the water. That's a long story, but we were blessed to live in a mansion on the water in one of the richest communities in the United States of America. We've lived out in the bush, in the jungle, where we didn't have running water and electricity. I promise you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our joy, 
our contentment, our life was as abundant and as equally happy in both those situations. It didn't depend on the stuff. It was because in both those instances, we were where God wanted us to be at the time. And joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, not of the stuff you have. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, not a fruit of what you have or the insurance policies that you have, or what you got hidden in the bank, or the lifeboats that you have hanging out. Your peace comes from the Word of God. Jesus Christ, who said, let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. That's what it's about. Having that mind set on the things above. And knowing that that's better than this. Which is why our desire is to say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Yes. Rejoicing at the same time that he is patient, desiring that none should perish. God has given you a great gift. He has given you time. God has given you time to reach the lost. He is not giving you time to get another promotion, get a bigger and better house. To get, He has given you time to reach the lost. That's why Peter wrote, that's why, don't be surprised that the end hasn't come yet. It's not that his promise is, is forgotten, it's because he desires that none should perish. Behave properly towards outsiders. You see how this is all woven together as, a, as like one piece of cloth, right? So, knowing that our desire should be for the coming of the Lord. And that should, be a, that should be a burning desire, tempered by knowing that God has us here to participate in his word. Paul goes on to say, 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to be from verse 13 to 18, I'm going to read that whole thing, right? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort. God wants us to have comfort. The first thing I want to touch on there is Paul saying, we do not want you to be uninformed. This is important. Religion Religion. I'm not talking about spirituality. I'm not talking about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about your relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about organized religion. It tends to be very secretive. Mm, it's, it's a secret society with a priesthood who always stands between you and God. That, by the way, um, see how I distract myself? Get me back on... I, I've had an experience this week... Uh, just dealing with bureaucracy. And as some of you may know, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a, a hip replacement from the, the, from the VA, a new body part. Uh, as a result of the accident that I had when Alice and I lived as missionaries down in Central America. And uh, for my service in flying in the U.S. Navy, I am entitled to VA medical thingy. But I am also subject to the bureaucracy of this. So I've been going through this whole process and dealing with doctors, and I had a meeting with a doctor this week, which was blessed by the Lord. I saw the favor of God in all of this. But the doctor was explaining to me, you know, the, the process and all of the concerns that he has about the process, because it's a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of the medical decisions that are made are made by the accountants or clerks rather than by the doctors. Right, right. This is what is called a bureaucracy. A bureaucracy is kind of a, you know, a, a, a whole layered management process before you can get to where you got to go. You got to go through all these bureaucrats. All these hoops. 
And I said to the doctor, I said, thank God. I said, thank God that my relationship with him is not a bureaucracy. He has given me the right. He has given me permission. He has called me to this knowledge that I can go straight into the presence of the Almighty God. I can come with confidence, before, with boldness before the throne of grace. I don't have to go through the saints. I don't have to go through Mary. I don't have to go through anybody because there is one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's made a way to skip the bureaucracy. I can go straight to God. And that, I promise you, is a blessing beyond our understanding. Okay? Is the Lord's Prayer part of the Sermon on the Mount? Yes, it is. That was a radical prayer. That's because the, the whole thing God. is the most radical God. sermon ever preached. Absolutely. Well, just the first two words, our Father, says, I'm approachable. You can come to me. Now, is when do you not ever been able to go to your Father? That's, that's a whole, I mean, the whole thing. It's, you know, being able to call out Abba, Father, just being able to call out Daddy to him. But that's what I'm saying. There's no bureaucracy. Jesus Christ removed all of the bureaucracy from our relationship with God. So that's a joyful thing. But God wants you to be aware of that. He doesn't, and this is what Paul said, he doesn't want you to be uninformed. Just, I want to read you a few verses here. This is from Joel 3.16. By the way, Amos says the same thing. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The Lord roars from Zion. Proverbs, wisdom stands in the street and shouts. She lifts her voice in the square. Okay? Mm -hmm. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, David wrote in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said this, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery for which, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be now made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. The purpose was to make known the manifold wisdom of God. God is a God of revelation. God wants us not to be uninformed. This is why he had Solomon, this man filled with wisdom as a gift from God, to write that we're to seek knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. We had a really neat conversation this Sunday where I started out by talking about, uh, and you, you got to bear with me on this and catch the gist. I don't get too involved and don't pull out your dictionary. I said that by and large, Revelation is closed. From Genesis 1 to, to Revelation chapter 22, the Word of God says we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. The only revelation that we have to look forward to, that we have to look forward to, is the revelation of Christ Jesus. When that event happens that Paul is talking about here, when Christ comes in the air to get us. Mm -hmm. All right? When Christ is revealed, and it says when we see him as he is, we will be as he is. Revelation is closed. We have, God has revealed everything. He's revealed the entire plan, right? We've been given everything. And what struck me, I was, and this is what I was sharing on Sunday, if you've seen The Wizard of Oz, um, at the end of The Wizard of Oz, the, the four, Dorothy and the Tin Man, lion the, the and Lion the and the Scarecrow, have returned to the presence of the wizard, having accomplished the tasks that he had set for them. But meanwhile, he starts to rebuff them and tell them it's not sufficient and everything. And the little dog runs over and there's a curtain there and the dog pulls away the curtain and there's this man standing behind the curtain. So the four of them see the man behind the curtain, but they don't quite get what's happening at first. The man is revealed as a revelation, but does not understand it. And then they understand that he is the guy who is the wizard, not this thing that they had been seeing. 
But as the movie goes on to its conclusion right after that, they get greater understanding of the fact that what they had been desiring, they already had. See, there was a great song written in the a revamp of this called, um, Oz, what was it then? He's on Down? No. Like Tim Timmy, never did get anything. Oz never gave anything oh, to, that they oh, didn't yeah. already have. Bob Dylan? Was it Bob Dylan? Well, whoever. It was like, you know, Oz never did nothing for yeah. the Tin Man that he didn't already have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they found out, so they got a greater understanding. My point in all of this is they had a revelation, but then the revelation was over. But they didn't have understanding at first. Then they got understanding. Then they got deeper understanding. God has given revelation. Right? If you have been saved by His Son, Jesus Christ, and His work on the cross, God has given you complete revelation of His plan from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, which is why He said, don't add to it, don't take away. There's nothing to add to it. We don't need more revelation. What we need is understanding of what has been revealed. The purpose of Bible studies and the purpose of your own personal time in the Word and conversation with the Lord is to get understanding of what God has revealed. And this is why it's so important, because no matter how long you've been serving the Lord, no matter how long you've been studying the Word, there is still greater understanding to be had. All right? Until He comes back. Until He comes back in that final revelation of Jesus as He is. So spend time. Spend time. And don't, you know, I, I think it was last week or the week before we talked about the fact that that pride will keep you right where you are because you'll be satisfied with where you are. You'll be content where you are. I mean, in, in a bad sense. Yeah. Whereas humility will drive you to seek more and more of God and the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the understanding of God, and the things of God. God is a God of revelation. He wants you to be informed. He wants you to know. Go read the first two chapters of Proverbs this week. And see his instruction on gaining knowledge, on gaining wisdom, on gaining this understanding of the things of God. All right? We've had the revelation, now we need understanding. Now, I'm just going to read this next thing. We're not going to be able to get into it because of the time. But he says, this is about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve. The, the first thing is, they're asleep. They're not dead. That's right. They already died. You know, I want to see dead. Let me show you dead. For I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. There's no reason. Paul said that death, where, where is our victory? Where is our sting? Death has been conquered. And, you know, it's a, something I really want to get into because we have a hope that the world doesn't have. And that's what Paul is talking about here. We're supposed to have an understanding that the world doesn't have. Because we have access to wisdom that the world doesn't have. Mm -hmm. The world has, as James says, they have, they have wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic. Mm -hmm. We have wisdom from above. We need to understand what God has revealed. If you have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have died. Mm -hmm. You don't have to fear death. It wasn't so bad, was it? The only thing that can happen now is you can fall asleep. You can go. You can get. You can go from here to there, to someplace better. And that's what we'll pick up next week because that's just too much to get yeah, into at this at this time. Again, I just want to remind you that we welcome your comments, your questions, your suggestions. You can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com uh, and find others to come and be part of this. And they can go back and and see all of the sessions in First Thessalonians that have preceded this. We're blessed that you can be with us. We're blessed that we're able to share this with you. So let's let's depart until next week when we'll pick up right here with this. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have in your grace, your mercy, chosen to reveal your plan to us and your plan was that your son Jesus Christ would do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves when he went to that cross. He took the sins of the world upon himself. 
that we would be right with you and can come boldly before your throne. That the bureaucracy is destroyed and that we have access to you. That we have been made righteous. That we have been made right with you. And Father, above all, I thank you for that, for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Until next time, next week, same place, same time. God bless you. May you be used for his glory. Is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.